All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Um, and we're just really excited to have you here in the room and those folks online to join us for today's seminar. Um, just a couple of logistics in case you're new to our setup. Um, like I said, this is a hybrid event, so that means folks online. We do have your cameras, mics, and screen shares disabled, but we would love it if you communicated it with us in chat. Um, and Roseanne is a volunteer who's going to be monitoring any questions you might have for today's speaker, or if you have any technical issues, she can help you navigate those as well. For folks in the room, uh, I'm looking around and you've done this with me before, but yeah, uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand at the end of today's presentation and we'll get you a mic and that means that folks online can hear your questions as well. All right, uh, a couple of really quick announcements for our next seminar, and I wrote this date and I couldn't believe it, it's February 1st. Um, so our next seminar is next week, February 1st, when um, Kelly Sutherland from the University of Oregon's Oregon Institute of Marine Biology will be here talking about uh, zooplankton ecology, form, function, and flow. So I'm excited to um, hear what Kelly has to share with us. I also just wanted to promote our next Science on Tap, which is our evening public events, will be February 7th. Suzanne Brander's talk has been rescheduled um, for that date. She was going to talk earlier, and we had to reschedule her. Um, she is going to talk about plastic impacts on organisms in Oregon and beyond. So I hope you can join us for that event. It'll be in this room starting at 6. If you need more information about any of our upcoming events, you can go to the HMSC homepage, go to um, the bottom of the screen and all the details you might need for any of our events is there. Um, but for today, we have a great speaker to join us and we're very excited. And so let me just give you a little bit of background about Kelsey King. She is a PhD candidate, which uh, I just learned she's passed all of her exams. So we're very excited about that um, at Washington State University in Vancouver. Uh, Kelsey graduated with her BA in biology and environmental studies at Cornell. Uh, her research focuses on at-risk species reliant on uh, grass ecosystems, and her research goal is to inform conservation of wildlife and plants based on understanding of species' unique dynamics and interactions with their ecosystem. Her dissertation is focused on um, investigating the impacts of climate change on the common blue butterfly. So I'm going to hand it off to her right now. Thank you. All right. Um, and in, in classic tradition of my life, um, I just want to say uh, it's not that Cornell, it's the other one. Um, it's Cornell College in Mount Vernon, not that Mount Vernon, the other one, Mount Vernon, Iowa. And <laughs> I currently uh, go to Washington State University for my PhD. And of course, it's not that campus, it's the other one in Vancouver, not that Vancouver, the other one, Vancouver, Washington. <laughs> Thank you. I've been accumulating these for many years, so it's great to be able to share those now. Um, I'm also now currently, since I finished uh, my exams and I'm just writing my dissertation, um, I chose to leave teaching and just focusing on writing to be um, a fish and wildlife employee, uh, which has been really exciting. I just started this fall and I'm actually now the species lead for the butterfly I studied and we'll be talking about today, uh, Fender's Blue and also the lead for Taylor's Trekker spot in Oregon. So if you're interested in talking about those, um, you can pull my email from the end and reach out. So without further ado, I will go ahead and get started. So today I'm gonna pull um, mostly from one chapter of my dissertation that helps quantify the importance of nectar for butterfly populations. Make sure my laser pointer is on. Okay. So the Fender's blue butterfly um, is part of a species complex with currently 26 recognized subspecies across the United States. It's threatened in the United States by um, the Endangered Species Act. There are others that are at risk in the US, including the Mission Blue, which is also listed under the Endangered Species Act. And you can find that one in San Francisco. And in Canada, some of the species, subspecies that are really common here are at risk in um, different uh, territories. For fenders, one of the important things is seeing how small the butterfly is. A lot of folks don't realize how small we're talking. The wingspan is less than an inch, but you can actually see the butterfly perched on my ear here. 
If you are a hiker, you might have been visited by a blue butterfly at some point. They like to visit people and lick the sweat off our socks, our wristbands, and in this case, my ear. Um, and this actually happened to me by be my birthday, which was a really fun present. And I was with my advisor who had um, actually done her dissertation work 15 years before at this site. Um, so it was fun because she got to take lots of pictures of this um, and has used it in some of her talks to show the scale of the butterfly. All right, so without further ado, let's talk butterfly life cycle. So since I'm at a marine science center, I'll go through this one a little more slowly, but it's very similar <laughs> where we have lots of stages. For butterflies, um, we're always gonna start in the egg our little babies. These are the eggs. You can see a finger here as a reference for how small these are, usually just a couple of millimeters across. These happen to be hatched eggs. If you squint really hard, you can tell they're kind of a little donut. And that's because the caterpillars actually emerge from these. And for fenders, um, they're typically going to be eggs throughout lupin patches in May, June. Those caterpillars hatch about 10 days after they're laid. And they're very small and they look almost exactly like the lupin leaf being the same color. And uh, they won't get too big. They just get a little bit bigger before entering diapause. So the summer starts to get really hot. They will go into the soil. This is an upturned soil chunk uh, next to a lupin. So it's about two centimeters in uh, very mossy light soil. And you can barely see this caterpillar starting to turn red, which is what tells us that it's entered diapause. They're green because they're eating fresh plant tissues, so the chlorophyll is making them green, and then they turn red once they stop eating. So this one's a fun color-changing indicator of diapause that you don't get in a lot of butterfly species, so it's a fun one to see. And so by July or August, most of these caterpillars are going to be in the soil, sleeping, then they'll um, overwinter and pop up in the spring, usually February, March, depending on how cold we are, <laughs> and they'll be eating the lupin as it comes up in the spring as well. This is a caterpillar. They're usually like 13 to 15 millimeters long before they'll pupate. So again, still very small, but much bigger than they started out. And they'll close usually at the end of April, start of May. Um, the males are blue and the females are brown. So they are sexually dimorphic. And the thing I wanna point out to you for fenders throughout their life cycle, they're very tied to their host plant, which is the lupin. Um, so you can find them in and around that even as adults, they're not dispersing very far um, from those host plants. In my research, I used two other subspecies. So I'm just gonna show you them. They uh, will all look very similar. So I'm not trying to play tricks on you. They do look the same. <laughs> the Puget Blue here is found west of the Cascades in Washington. So it's gonna be in the South Puget Sound around Olympia. Um, also in the Olympic Peninsula. And um, I worked on that uh, for part of my research in the beginning before I moved on to fenders. They are found throughout the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, currently, you know, big populations around Eugene, Corvallis, um, north of Salem. And then we have the Pembina blue. There's other subspecies in and around the Cascades. So the delineation can be a little tricky here. But for the Pembina blue, it's the most common one throughout the United States and Canada, spreading essentially from west of the Cascades all the way to the Rockies. Each of these subspecies tends to be associated with one host plant across most of the range. They can vary depending on site and still be considered the same subspecies. But overall, you know, Puget blues are often found on sickle keel lupin, which looks like this, Lupinus albicollis. Bender's blue is generally found on Kincaid's lupin, uh, Lupinus organis, which is also a <laughs> threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And then the montane blues, many of you probably seen this lupin on your hikes. It's called broadleaf lupin or Lupinus latifolius, and it's my favorite because it smells amazing. So next time you're hiking, check it out. The plants that are providing nectar include the lupin and these, uh, some of these plants. So just to give you an idea of the diversity of plants that they will be visiting um, and trying to get nectar from. When we're talking about nectar plants and trying to figure out what is food for a butterfly, uh, folks usually use something called floral syndrome for pollinators. 
And you can kind of think of this as fitting the puzzle pieces together. And it's part of how the flower is attracting the pollinators. They're using color, scent, flower, shape, the depth of the flower uh, that determines where the nectar is in the flower and other physical characteristics like can the butterfly perch on it? Will the butterfly hover to nectar or not? Most of the time, not for butterflies. And then also the nutrients provided. If you eat a bad apple, are you going to go back to that tree a bunch of times? And if you get a bad apple every time, probably not, right? Um, some great examples that a lot of folks know is hummingbirds prefer bright red flowers that typically have these long tubes. The nectar is actually held at the base of those tubes, and the long beak and long tongue um, allow the, the hummingbird to actually reach that nectar, whereas bees cannot fit their face, and their tongue is not long enough, and most butterflies' um, proboscis isn't long enough to reach into that either. Bees also have a lot of different plants that kind of target them. A great example is anything in the legume family, like the lupins, which are specifically designed to throw pollen at the bee when the bee lands on the flowers. It's a very fun mechanism. That's the thing you might wanna write down to Google later. It's very cool. And uh, a classic one is moth. So there are a lot of very specific single moth, single flower species where basically no other moth can pollinate that plant. And that's partially because of that nectar holding depth where the moth has a very specific proboscis head size and all of that to fit into the flower. Those are typically going to be white flowers. Moths are often feeding at night, so they don't need to be colored. And those tend to be more fragrant because moths are not using sight to find the flowers, they're using smell. There are some mimicry pieces to flowers that can get thrown in this mix. Um, one involves that nutrient piece where things can look like they have good food, but don't. Um, and so that's uh, one of the examples that they're showing here with the butterfly, where um, this butterfly probably can't tell the difference in color between these two, but the shapes is the same. Bees, you might have heard there are some flowers that mimic the coloration and pattern of a female bee's behind. So the male will go visit that <laughs> flower and they get pollen on them in that process. And for flies, a classic example with tropical plants that are often mimicking a dead animal in both scent and color. So those are different ways that the floral syndrome can help us here. In my system, it's not as complicated as these mimicries. It's really, can they fit on this flower or not? These like to perch. So we can look back at that figure and can try to imagine one, can they fit on it? Can they perch? They have a pretty short proboscis, so we're not looking for things with long tubes. So plants like these two, one has a really long tube that's very narrow, so our butterfly is not going to be able to access that. And this, um, that's a larkspur here, and this paintbrush has a similar problem with a long tube. It's red. Hey, that sounds like a hummingbird plant to me. It's actually often pollinated by flies, which is fun, um, that it looks like a hummingbird plant, but it's for flies. If you want to uh, look at that research, I can point you to it later. But these other ones, despite things like the iris maybe not looking like they fit, the butterfly can actually, because it's so small, fit in and around all these crevices. So one is watching the butterfly and seeing how it moves on these flowers, which flowers it's on. But especially when you're doing work, like I am trying to figure out if um, there are nectar plants that could be used in the future if climate change is continuing to have our butterfly get earlier and earlier every year, which is what we've seen with vendors. Um, this part becomes really important to trying to piece together what could be a nectar plant. We also do some nectar sampling to get at the nutrients, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So now, my question is wanting to figure out how important is nectar to these butterfly populations. We know that host plant resources are a necessity. So the resources that the larvae are eating, those lupin leaves are needed for the larvae to survive to adulthood, right? So we don't get adult butterflies if we don't have enough host plant. So obviously they're a high priority, um, but both host plant and nectar resources are invested in eggs. So 
without nectar resources, we might not be able to produce enough eggs to have a viable population. So if nectar resources are improving that fecundity, it's still not 100% clear to us how much they're improving that, and then how does that translate to population? So how does that improvement actually fit into the full life cycle? Pulling back some really fun research on um, carbon isotope tracking. If you're interested in this fun paper, um, I have it referenced here, but I'm just gonna try to summarize it quickly for you. So what they did was feed butterflies one carbon isotope with the larval resources, the host plants, and a different one with the nectar. So in the eggs that were then produced by those female butterflies, they could track how much of that carbon in the eggs actually came from the nectar that their mom consumed. And what they found is that that ratio differed as the butterfly aged. So when they were younger, they were able to use more host resources. That makes sense, right? Because that's a finite resource. Once you're an adult, you don't get any more uh, host plant. And then it kind of peaked out at a certain level where they were continuing whatever they had developed in those eggs as a pupa was kind of set. And then the nectar was finishing off the rest of the development. And that was different by species. Um, I will introduce the Mormon fritillary up here in a moment. Um, this is a heliconius butterfly, a tropical butterfly. Uh, this is a moth. This is um, the orange sulfur for folks who might know that one. And this is a checker spot, actually the Baltimore checker spot. Okay, so to give you an example of how nectar is increasing fecundity, I'm gonna show you two extremes. So one I did just mention, um, which is the Mormon fritillary, um, this formerly Spiria genus, now under Arginus. So I will use Arginus from now on, uh, though the old research will all use Spiria. When the butterflies could eat as much as they want in this ad libitum treatment, they were able to lay almost 300 eggs on average. And so this is going to be per female. When they were able to eat only half that, that was about half of the fecundity, right? We're here at about 150. And when they were only able to eat a third of what they could eat whenever they wanted to, it was again about a third. So you can see that if they had no nectar, they would produce no eggs, right? In this case, we follow this line going down. At some point, there's a small amount of nectar that can be given and they will still produce almost no eggs. So that means that without nectar, this population will disappear. This one's not a question to us. If you don't produce eggs without nectar, you're not gonna have butterflies in the next year. On the other hand, the common imperial blue, which is actually not in the same family as the Fender's blue and the blues I study, it's a different blue family because they're from Australia. Um, when they were fed on water, so not fed any nectar at all, they were able to lay over 200 eggs, which is a lot. And then when they were able to eat pretty much as much as they want, they were able to lay almost 400 eggs. A fun fact about why the high is a little bit lower than the mid um, species in the same family, the Lysenid family, which includes this and the Fender's blue, if they get fed as much as they want, they can put on so much fat that they can't walk. So <laughs> get a little obesity problem, um, which I did also see in my own experiments. Happy to share that photo later if you'd like. <laughs> So knowing what we know now, I wanted to know if nectar is required to reach sustainable population growth rates. Is nectar required to make that population persist over time or not? And for Fender's blue and other Boise Duval's blues, based on past research and what we know, especially from the recovery plan and all the research that went into that for Fender's blue, it seemed like nectar was going to be required, even if it's a very small amount. And then as an application, especially for part of my fish and wildlife work, we want to know how much nectar is required. So translating that lab estimate back to the field. Okay, so how we actually go about this is putting butterflies in cups. So these are double walled cups. So we have one cup with water, another cup that has a stem of lupin. The butterfly can't access the water, but they can run around the lupin as much as they like. And then we give them a little sponge. And on that sponge, we give them a known amount of sugar. And that sugar represents the nectar. And so they'll get a known amount every single day. We'll count all the eggs every single day. 
We'll weigh them, see how they're doing, mark how long they live, um, and also have to take care of all of their babies, which is what's in these cups and why we have all the lupin in the background. So I used four treatments um, for the data I'm gonna show you. So first is water. So we fed them no sugar and no amino acids. In this study, I looked at amino acids, but it's not very important for the population dynamics. So I'm not gonna talk about it too much here, but feel free to ask me questions. The second treatment mimicked the common composite or Asteraceae flowers that are found in the habitat that are one of the preferred nectar resources um, for Puget Blues and, and less frequently for fenders. Um, and that had about 65 milligrams of sugar per day for each butterfly and about seven milligrams of amino acids. The next treatment had the same amount of sugar, but just a little more amino acids. So I'm not really gonna talk about the difference between these two, but this represents more of the lupin nectar, which tends to be the dominant nectar chosen by Puget Blues, which is why we studied that. And this final treatment just has one sponge of the lupin and one sponge of the flower. So the butterfly can choose between however much amino acids they want, which is more like what they do in the wild, um, and a total of 135 milligrams of sugar. So what we saw, unsurprisingly, is that nectar increased fecundity and longevity. So the treatments I want you to focus on comparing is the green and the blue. And so this shows the day that the butterfly came into the lab and started the diet and the number of eggs they laid that day. And so you can see that the water only lived about five days. So without nectar, they're not living much past five days. And when we had um, that 130 milligrams of sugar, the high treatment here, you know, we were able to lay much more and significantly more eggs each day than the water treatment. So you're able to produce more eggs. And of course, that meant on average, we were laying many more eggs uh, when we had lots of nectar. And we could, <laughs> of note, live up to 26 days. That's a long time. Our field estimates are usually somewhere around 10 to 14 days for these butterflies to give you some context. So in the lab, they can live like 26 days. It's a long time to take care of a butterfly. <laughs> so what we did then to figure out how the fecundity and the longevity of these butterflies that we saw in the lab actually translates to the population was put those numbers in a population model. So what we wanted to know was the population growth rate lambda, and we used the fecundity that we got from that experimental data. So we took how long the butterfly lived, randomly sampled from our distribution of the data, and then we summed how, uh, how many eggs they would have laid on each of those days to get the total fecundity across that lifespan. And then we used a survival estimate from the field. Um, this was for Fender's Blue and ended up being about 45 site years. So pretty robust set of uh, possible survival. And we didn't vary that at all because we just wanted the variation to represent what we saw in the experiment. So on average, they survive uh, from egg to pupa. About 2.6 of those individuals will survive. So less than 3% of the eggs are going to make it to adulthood. And what we saw is that nectar is needed to reach viable population growth rates. So I'm gonna walk you through this. It's the same four treatments that we've talked about. Here, the baseline is one. Um, so for lambda of, lambda of one means I have 100 butterflies in year one, I have 100 butterflies in year two, right? So it's the same number of butterflies every year. And because we have an annual life cycle, that would be the, the children, same number of children as we had parents. The 1.55 is our viable population growth rate. And this is from work that was done as part of recovery planning for Fender's Blue, looking at the variation and the number of butterflies and saying, if we had a, a population growth rate of 1.55, on average, these butterflies would persist for 95 years, 100 years. So this is kind of the target that we use in the recovery plan. And so it's where we're thinking, if we have over this number, it's almost certainly a viable population. And we see when we have the 65 milligrams of nectar, we're above the lambda of one. So the population on average persists from year one to year two, but maybe not into year 50, certainly maybe not into year 100. Whereas over here, when we have a lambda of two, 
we're doubling the population every year. So we're going from 100 butterflies to 200 butterflies. So in that case, if that happens year after year, you get exponential population growth <laughs> and um, really crazy numbers of butterflies. So putting that back on the spectrum I showed you at the beginning um, that shows us like the range of different um, improvements in fecundity for our common imperial blue here that laid 200 eggs without any nectar, you know, that's probably less important for their population. Can't say for sure until we put it in a model and look at their larval survival. But for our boys through balls, we saw like 60 eggs uh, without any nectar. So much fewer eggs. And that represents about 20% of what they laid on our highest treatment. And then compare that to the Mormon fritillary, which basically can't lay eggs without nectar. So trying to put this in a spectrum for us. Um, we'd like to get more information to be able to put that in a population model to actually see if that holds. But just to give you an idea, generally, this is a big table, so don't pay too much attention to what's on here, but more how many species fall into each category. So here, just like the common imperial blue, our species that are laying 50% of or more of eggs without nectar than when they lay. So double the number when they have nectar than, than when they don't, or up to 100% where it's the same whether they have nectar or not. And then here's more similar to the Boise Duval's blue where they're laying 20 to 50% of the eggs without nectar. And here in the very small category, like our Mormon fritillary, less than 20% of eggs when they don't have nectar to zero, like we would see in the Mormon fritillary. If you're interested in actual species, I can talk more about that or refer you to different papers. Um, and the asterisks indicate that I just had to extrapolate data um, since they didn't necessarily have everything I wanted. And what I want to stress is that you know, that spectrum I showed you and that table is giving us an idea of how important nectar is, but we can't really assess it without looking at how many eggs do they need to have a viable population. And that's really dependent upon those survival components are 2% surviving, like we see with um, the boys evolves to adulthood from the eggs, or 20%, that's going to change the dynamic. So it's important to put those vital rates into the population model to really get that answer in a satisfying way. So now taking the results to how much nectar is actually needed. So applying it and answering questions that our stakeholders for vendors um, are interested in. So for recovery criteria, um, the target is 20 milligrams per meter. I'll talk through what that actually means in a second. Um, it's divided into each third of the flight period. So in a six week flight period, in the first two weeks, the peak two weeks, and the last two weeks, um, we can divide that into four, 12, and four, and I'll show you that calculation in a moment. But generally speaking, the managers, the folks who are actually doing the restoration to keep these butterflies going, think the target might be too high, it might not be needed at all the sites, and also have asked me, do butterflies even need that much nectar? So <laughs> we're gonna take the data that we have and try and extrapolate that over. So first, just to give you an idea of how we estimate sugar in the field, it looks like a sort of complicated equation, but really what it is, is we take how much sugar is in each flower, we multiply that by the number of days that flower is open, so that's the sugar produced by that flower across its lifespan. We'll multiply that by the sampling unit, since you can't fit a whole raceme of lupin in a tube to wash it and get the nectar. You have to take one flower and figure out what's in that and then put it to try and get a raceme. And then you wanna go in the field and count how many flowers are there. And when you put all that together, you'll get the amount of sugar that's being contributed across the landscape by a given species. So we can sum that up across all the species across the flight period and get that 20 milligrams. And that previous target is based on data. So they went to the field, they calculated how much sugar is available, sampled all the flower species to figure out how much is in there. And then they figured out how many butterflies they had per hectare. So when we looked at the total bulk nectar available 
we didn't see any strong correlation. But when we looked at the native nectar, um, which another, another part of this study found was preferred by females, so the females, the ones who are making the eggs, uh, prefer the native nectar, there was a correlation um, between the number of butterflies and the amount of nectar. So on this figure, we can draw a little line. So the target of somewhere in the middle of the densities of these two at about 400 butterflies and then pulling that down gives us about 20 milligrams per meter. So this is a much less intensive way than what I'm about to do to figure out what the nectar target is and uh, we'll see if they match up. So 20 milligrams total across the flight period. Butterfly flight periods look like this, where they start to come out. Most of them are here, and then they start to die. If we divide this normal distribution up, 60% of the butterflies would be in that peak in the middle, 20% would be in the earlier, and 20% would be in the later. So you can simply take 20% of the 20 to get that four and to get that 12. So that's how we did it, right? As simply as possible. Going back to our figure from before, looking at the population growth rates across our treatments, we know we wanna be on average at 1.55. So that means we need to be somewhere between 130 and 65 milligrams per day for each female butterfly in the population. So we'll do our same calculation in this zone. And so we'll just calculate it for this, calculate it for this, and hopefully in the middle we'll have a good answer. So how we translate from individual need to the field is pretty much the same way as we did before. <laughs> we take how many butterflies are there in terms of how many butterflies per meter squared are there, and we find an average through time. We're not necessarily trying to support these super high years, right? We want to make sure on average, at our average density, the butterflies have enough. It's okay if in some years they don't have enough, but we want the majority of years to have enough nectar. So we take these density estimates from distance sampling, which I can talk about if you have questions. And these sites were selected to be part of my study um, for other data I'm not talking about here because of um, having kind of stable, large populations through time. And generally, they have sufficient nectar in one or two of the periods of flight, but not necessarily all of them. But they do have stable populations of fenders. So we thought these would be OK places to look at butterfly densities and, and pull that from. Okay. Sorry. So to do the translate from the individual need um, to the field, we can take the daily butterflies per meter. So you know, day 120, how many butterflies per meter do we have on average? and multiply that by the amount of sugar needed that day. And that then gives us the sugar per meter. So about to show you a table, walk through it with me. <laughs> so in terms of the flight period, the early peak and late as defined in the recovery plan fits in these little two week boxes, the before and the after. Some years we have flight periods longer than six weeks and some we don't. So in this more intensive version of the analysis, we counted how much sugar would be needed in those zones as well. It turned out to be pretty low. But you can see in the early peak and late, that's our recovery target and our total target here. If we we're to give the butterflies 130 milligrams per meter, um, uh, each butterfly 130 milligrams, that's gonna be that target or higher. And this is gonna be that stable population growth rate or higher. So somewhere in between these two, that 130 and the 65 milligrams per butterfly is where we wanna be. And you can look at the numbers if you'd like, but when we sum them up, the average of those two numbers is 21. <laughs> so what we learn is they are the same. <laughs> So I just wanna um, kind of compare the amount of effort that went into each of these methods. <laughs> For the field estimate that we use in the recovery plan, you know, we estimated the sugar across a site for a year. That required us to sample every flower species for nectar and gather those other characteristics. We had to estimate floral density by counting the flowers across the site. We uh, got an average butterfly density across three years and <laughs> then made a simple linear model of butterfly density explained by the sugar density to pull a middle butterfly density 
and what that sugar density would be to get us that target. In this very long experimental method that I did, we fed the butterflies various diets. We incorporated those vital rates into a population model. We had to get data from for immature survival that was more than 40 site years of effort <laughs> to get a really robust estimate. We determined the individual need per day by looking at that population model. And then we also needed a target population growth rate from a viability analysis. Luckily, that was done for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to determine the average daily density of butterflies at these good sites across a couple of years. And um, we had to have past data for those sites to make sure they were sites we wanted to look at. Then we multiplied the butterfly density by the sugar need, which was the simplest step. And then we could just sum it across the flight period to get what the target is. The moral of the story, those two numbers were almost identical. <laughs> So your estimates don't necessarily need to be comprehensive, individual-based, or using these population models to be accurate. Not to toot my PhD advisor's horn, but a really thoughtful study design gave the same estimate as a lot of work <laughs> did. Um, so that little extra legwork um, of like sampling all those flowers and getting that sugar density estimate, which initially sounds like a lot of work, but now thinking about how much work I did seems like less work uh, <laughs> is, is a good thing to consider. And if you'd like to look more at that paper, um, I can send it to you as well. So in conclusion, on average, you know, we saw that the nectar can limit butterfly populations and can probably limit many butterflies populations. There are very few examples that we found where it seemed like maybe they would be okay without nectar. And so in terms of recovery planning or restoration, those nectar resources are just as important as host plants in many species. The nice caveat for folks who um, are familiar with butterflies know is many host plants also provide nectar. So that kind of takes a little bit of the burden off us to really hit the nectar hard. And, you know, but that nectar abundance should still be a high priority. And, you know, don't, don't do a huge amount of work if you can kind of do it in a little bit of a rougher way. <laughs> and maybe then 15 years later, you can do it another way to show the people that it was the same the whole time. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank all of the folks who've funded things throughout my dissertation, um, folks who've donated, including Sun Grow Horticulture and Portland Hydroponics. A lot of my fenders work was funded um, through a USGS Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center Fellowship. I use data that I didn't talk about here from the Consortium of Pacific Northwest Herbaria. And most of my work was funded through the CERTIP Department of Defense grant. Um, and I worked on a lot of different sites, including Department of Defense lands and a lot of our great vendors partners. And then of course my lab mates, advisor, partner, friends, who've all helped me actually get all the work done. Questions? Great. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions. Any questions online, Roseanne? Yes, we do. Um, how far will fenders disperse from their original host plant? Is it dependent on the size of the local Kincaid's lupin population? Yes. So the butterflies will generally stay within 50 meters of their host plant. So often they're not dispersing very far. And so it's kind of a, a curve of if it's close to the lupin, they're going to get there within 50 meters. They're going to be there pretty regularly. 500 meters, a little less regularly. And then kind of at two kilometers is where we think that kind of boundary is where there's not very frequent dispersal beyond that. And that's what we use um, in our like recovery plan and species status assessment. Great. Thank you. How about questions in the room? You spend a lot of time on calories, but it almost seemed like at the beginning that diversity was as important, if not more important, of nectar resources. Yeah. Yeah. So a diversity of nectar resources is really important in the field because the timing of each flower is different every year. So is the timing of the butterfly. So our recovery criteria for fenders, for example, is at least five nectar species in each site. Usually we're shooting for seven or more in like great habitat. 
Um, and that's an addition to the host plant just because it doesn't always work out how we want it. You know, sometimes we plant a lot and it just, they don't come out early enough. Um, so having a diversity of, of nectar species there kind of helps buffer against these super fun, really cold years or really warm years. <laughs> Whereas, you know, in recovery planning and, and my research, we're kind of thinking about what's happening on average. The, the restoration folks have to deal with the <laughs> what's changing every year and that diversity really helps that. Questions online? Yeah, uh, I'm curious where you sourced information that characterizes each plant family's approximate nectar and amino acid content slash provision. Yes, so we have been doing that for fenders since the late 90s. Um, and so there's two methods that we've used and that folks who are interested in, in this for bees and butterflies use. One is nectar wicking, um, where you stick a piece of paper in a flower and it sucks up the nectar. And then you can use um, some fun colorimetric assays to see how much sugar is there. Or you can wash the flower, which is what we had to do with a lot of the Puget Blue flowers because they're not super amenable to the wicking piece, um, where you take the flower, you put it in some water, you wash it, and then you, again, do the colorimetric assay. So in terms of where I source my stuff, we have a large database of all of the flowers we've sampled and what the sugar was in that, uh, and then translated that to the flower. So um, for fenders, we have a great database, and we share that with folks who are working in similar areas. Um, but you, you do have to build that yourself, which is why that 90s study seemed like a lot of work at the time, because they did almost 200 samples for a lot of these species. And it was, I think, 15 species total were used in that paper. So it's a lot. Questions in the room? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've heard a lot about uh, these uh, uh, habitats, uh, these high coast range meadow habitats like Mary's Peak, Mount Hebo, things like that. Does that affect this species? Yeah, so there are Boise Balls Blues at Mary's Peak and Mount Hebo. So um, in addition to having just the normal variation in climate leading to different flowers being available, um, you might also have some fun climate change impacts like the forest growing over the meadows and things like that that can cause extra pressure you know in the in the valley we're not as worried about those things but for the montane species like the pembina blues you know their meadows are really threatened by the tree encroachment so i would guess that's what's happening at some of some of those sites but yeah i mean they're also going to need the nectar and you know, we don't have as great um, species data for those montane ones and, and how much sugar is in their flowers because we haven't worked there in the field as much. Uh, gotcha. So the fender's more in the valley floor. Yeah, gotcha. fender's is in the valley floor and the Puget Blue does go into the Olympic Peninsula, um, but we haven't worked with a lot of those sites because they're primarily on national park land and it's harder to like cut flowers off of plants and things like that, um, leave things out overnight and and things like that because we have you have to like bag the flower overnight and to get national park permits you have to camp next to the bag or do a three-month permit process so like those things um do restrict our ability to do that but we could find the species elsewhere if, um folks really want to do those projects yeah. any other questions online roseanne yeah uh this is a comment uh please share the overfed butterfly photo <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I wish I put it in the slide. It's it's great. Um, the they rub all the scales off on their abdomen, and underneath it's clear, so you just see the bright yellow fat. Um, and you know the end of the butterfly's abdomen is their ovipositor. So for the blues, it's just they get a nice little roll over and around it. The saddest part was they couldn't walk anymore, and so I was like, well, I can't stop feeding you because you're part of the study, but. Uh, some of them really go hard on that next <laughs> And this is like 1500 milligrams of sugar per day, which is way, way more than they need. So <laughs> the 130 milligram butterflies did not do that, thankfully. Questions in the room? I love butterflies and I loved your presentation. Um, 
question for you. I know that it wasn't the focus of your study, but you did give kind of context in the beginning with these other types of pollinators. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had even anecdotal thoughts about or observations of competing yeah. for nectar with other pollinators. I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe hummingbirds wouldn't come into play here, but I have seen bees mm -hmm. chase butterflies off a of flower, for yeah. example. So I'm kind of curious. Um, and you kind of mentioned climate change a little bit, mm -hmm. and I would think that would impact populations also of some of those competing pollinators. Yeah. So I was just curious. Yeah, so um, in terms of competition, that's always a hard piece for us to capture because we can't measure like how much nectar they that was on a flower before and after a visit of a butterfly, for example. Um, we, we can measure, you know, how much nectar they drink on average and try to make guesses. But, you know, for Fender's blues, one of the uh, other species that's present is silvery blues. They come out a little bit earlier. And so in that early season um, where they overlap, there is more competition for nectar. Luckily, they do tend to prefer slightly different species. So I think there is um, some nice species specific preferences in what nectar they're looking for. And there's not... Um, a ton of really close relatives for fenders in the same habitat. But for some of the montane species, there are, you know, blues that are four or five species in the same two or three genuses in the same habitat, fighting on different host plants, but for the same nectar resources. So I think for the montane species, it might be more of a concern. Um, I think for fenders and pugets, you know, we've seen the bees knock them off of lupin flowers. Luckily, the lupin flower itself isn't often providing a huge amount of nectar. They like to lick um, like the, the stems and actually the unopened racemes that uh, were in some of my early photos. So when the raceme first develops, you know, it's small and there tend to be a lot of thrips in there. So we think it's um, the sap that's kind of leaking out that's giving really high amounts of sugar. So they're basically drinking lupin sap, it seems like. <laughs> and luckily, the bees don't um, go for that but they will kind of learn not to sit on the flowers um, in, in heavy bee years because they get head butted a lot. <laughs> and then I guess um, for climate change, for the other fun preview of my dissertation work, um, what we see is fenders and Puget blues are getting earlier every year, uh, much faster than any of the plants in the community. And so what that has meant since we've done a lot of our work over the last 15 years or so that it's a slightly different nectar community, not wildly drastically different, but you know, every 15 years or so, it might be good to update some of our timings tables that we use to calculate how much sugar is there in a more rapid way than doing it the way that, that we <laughs> do it where we sample you know, every week. We count all the flowers that are there and things, <laughs> things like that. So to update kind of our rapid assessments for the new timing. Luckily for fenders, because we're managing them, as long as we adapt, and make sure that we're planting, say, more camas. Camas hiding here and here. Uh, if we're planting more camas, which is an early plant, you know, fenders will overlap more and more with that each year. And just kind of being on top of it, it's more of a problem for ecosystems that aren't intact or ecosystems that are managed by people. You know, people don't change right away. You know, we're going to notice. Wait, there's no more flowers anymore, and then start planting. So we don't want to get to that point when we have an endangered species. But, you know, in some of the montane meadows, the benefit is they have a lot more native diversity there to be that buffer when the butterfly is getting earlier. Questions online, Rosa? Questions in the room? Okay, I have a nerdy question about your study. Yeah. Um, talk to me about day zero. Like, how are you controlling day one? Yes. So... <laughs> Day zero, um, this is a species that doesn't like to breed in captivity. So unfortunately, I have to collect them in the wild. So day zero is the day that I go out to the prairie and I walk around until I get as many females as I can. Usually that's going to be like the 10 to 3 window. And then you don't see any more females. <laughs> they kind of rest for the day. And I put them in those cups. And then I put them in a travel bag and then I drive home. And so usually that's coming from Olympia about an hour and a half. 
um, for the montane species that was coming from Gifford Pinchot, also about an hour and a half, or Mount Hood for about two hours. Luckily, my Mount Hood year was during COVID, so there was not a lot of traffic coming back home at 3.30, 4 p.m., um, but I did have to climb ski slopes for that, and maybe this is too much information, but almost lost some toenails as part of the project, you know, climbing up and down. <laughs> Um, and so the day zero, um, really we found when we tested with silvery blues, they get stressed out pretty easily. So we catch them, we put them in vials, get to the car and put them in those cups as quickly as we can to minimize the stress. And then they kind of calm down. Any butterfly that died within the first 48 hours, we just excluded from the experiment because either they were maybe too old, uh, which we assessed with wing wear. So we try not to catch the older females, try to catch the nice pretty ladies <laughs> who are hopefully mated. Um, and if they did pass away, you know, maybe they got too stressed out, maybe they were too old. So we we excluded those, but that only happened once um, because we had tried with silvery blues before to make the transition process easy. But once they're in the lab, you know, they're pretty happy because they're getting fed a bunch <laughs> and in a nice controlled environment without any rain, doesn't get super cold at night. There's no wind. So they have a pretty good time. How did you account for variability of nectar on their home site? That's an excellent question. I did not. That is the, that is the biggest flaw. You found it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So that part is really difficult to capture um, without doing really intensive sampling. For the montane years, I actually had to work at multiple locations to get enough females. Uh, for Johnson Prairie, where I worked to collect Puget Blues, we knew how much nectar was there. And there was kind of a gap in the nectar, um, which was not amazing. And the butterflies were not living very long in the wild. So the hope was that because I was catching fresh females, they wouldn't have suffered too long. But we did do dissections of the females once they passed, where we could um, look in their abdomen, see how many eggs they have. They do start to digest those eggs. So they've invested a lot of those host resources in the eggs. They come out as adults and they fly around to try and get nectar. If they don't find nectar, they digest eggs. So you can kind of see that remnant piece. Um, and the amino acids is where that's coming in, where it seems like if we feed them amino acids, it might be making up for those previous losses. So they can in reinvest that in the egg, um, right? Because they can't build essential amino acids just like we can't. So if we feed that to them, they can put it back in their eggs and um, kind of make up for that loss. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions online? Questions in the room? Kelsey, anything anything else that you want to say about like your takeaway so we can end on a positive note instead of sort of been poking a hole in your study? <laughs> <laughs> no, the holes are great. Um, yeah, I would just like to reiterate, if you think about it first, then you don't have to do all this work to get the same number that you would have got the other way. So that's that's the moral of the story. Um, you know, you can get you can get these um, really important recovery criteria type estimates without having to do that amount of work. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, let's let you off the hook and just say one more time. Thank you very much. And for everybody in the room, I hope I see you again, uh, possibly on February 1st. Thanks, everybody. For those folks still online, thanks so much for joining us.